here is the social network which is in top 10 of all social networks and it is in top 100 across all the world's websites. We are most popular in Russian speaking audiences, um, uh, ex USSR and non ex USSR territories. However, we have clients from all other, from all over the world. Uh, so we have, you can see how much unique users we have per day and per month, uh, as well as this number of concurrent users uh, which we have at the peak hour. These users generate some quiet work on our websites, so we have to respond as fast as we can, so we can generate the more than 200 gigabits out of our concerns. Uh, this load is handled by more than 5,000 servers installed in five data centers. All data centers are located in Moscow. Uh, almost all software is written using Java uh, language. So about Cassandra and Odnoklassniki, we started to adapt Cassandra into our production since 2010, when we reached our first thousand of servers in, installed in data centers. We branched it since uh, 0 0.6 and did a lot of in-house development. We wanted to use Cassandra for business data, which are not fitting into the machine's run. Uh, uh, we primarily we aim it at full operation even in case of data center failure. Uh, we wanted to we wanted scalability, ease of operations like no failovers, no backups to external storages, no fixing broken master slave applications and so on. Uh, and we wanted the so the data storage solution to be adaptable so we can adapt it to fit exactly our needs. So now we have more than 20 clusters, they are different, small and large. In total we have more than 400 nodes in production and they store more, more than 200 terabytes of data. And since that time we survived, really survived several data centers failures and survived successfully. Talking now about all these 23 clusters will take too much time, so I will talk about, tell about the most interesting one. The fast one, the fat one, and the ugly one. <laughs> so, what's about, what I have, I have to tell about the fast cluster? The fast cluster is about the light widget. Everyone knows why light widget. You have a counter, uh, you have uh, a counter of likers, you have a content, and you have this widget uh, under the content. Uh, if you click on it, you will have uh, you written uh, next to the counter and if you mouse over on it, you will have, uh, you can see the friends, the friends of you who like it the same item. So light widget is everywhere. We have it on every page, so dozens of this light widget. Uh, I counted 20, more than 20 widgets on the main page of the site, on, the, on one page. Uh, we have it on feeds, feed timeline feeds. So this is the main consumer of, of like widgets. Uh, people mostly use for the, the timelines these uh, like widgets. Uh, and we have it on third-party websites through the like button. Uh, webmasters can integrate it, uh, this like button to their sites. So it's everywhere and it's on everything. Uh, there are many kinds of entities that would have like widget which are internal to on the here as well as sites you, you can have shared some external URLs so external uh, entities are also supported by, by this widget so because like widgets are everywhere and on everything you can suggest it's highly loaded and yes uh, it is making more than one million widget renders per every second and kind of much smaller number of writes, but still these writes are making more than, more than 100 million like records every day uh, and the data set grows in more than 15 gigabytes in storage every day. Uh, so, uh, and for Cassandra it is hard load, hard load profile because it is read most. Uh, not only because read most, read most is commonly not good for Cassandra, 
It has a long tail with many reeds, uh, not cacheable at all. And because the system is used from so many parts of the, the site, the latency variations in light processing harm almost everything. So we wanted uh, as stable latency as possible. Three terabyte data sets, since it seems not very big, uh, but it is big enough not to choose in memory only storages. <coughs> like Redis, for example. Let's see how, let's, look, uh, let's discuss how it could be implemented in SQL. Trying to solve this in SQL, we would have this simple table in our database having reference uh, uh, entity ID, entity type, user who likes the entity and when he likes the entity. So to render like widget, a single widget, we must execute these three queries. The first is to check the existence of uh, your like record on the entity, so we can render you or not render you. Uh, most of these queries result in no records found. The second one is to count total number of people who like an entity. Well, again, most of these will return zero count. Third is to find friends of you who like it the same entity. Looks simple. Sing single table with four fields. Uh, how do you think how many disk accesses this system would have? Well, <laughs> the correct answer is a lot. <laughs> On each of these queries you have disk accesses. It will have at least one logical read to check existence of the record for the first query. You will have some more to count records. Sometimes it has to be too much. Some of entities have more than a million likes. But the real problem is filtered by friends. Because friendship information is actually stored in separate cluster. So you have to pull all the friends from the separate cluster and execute first query against every friend from, from, from this uh, against every friend ID. So this this is the average number of friends you have. Uh, so making so much of disk accesses for high loaded data is not a good idea. Uh, the trick is that most of these queries are made against not existing data. So, and as we know, Cassandra uses Bloom filters to eliminate reads of not existing data. Uh, so this could help us a lot. Let's look how we could implement this in Cassandra. So we have two column families. The first one is used to store raw like records. It has reference type, reference ID, and user ID who like the entity. We define partition key to be the partition key of entity. And it's of users who like the entity is the clustering key. So all like records of the single entity are stored together. We have like count, column family to store on the count of users which uh, on the count of users which have to be incremented on like so we don't have to read many like records to count them. So let's count these accesses for Cassandra. Querying for for zero count uh, we have no disk accesses now. And this is good. Uh, but checking for, for previous life does not. Because Cassandra, Cassandra's Bloom filters eliminate uh, not, uh, reads of not existing partition keys only. But we have partition keys only to include the entity ID. So we will have 20 persons of these queries will hit this. So consider the long tail, we have 40 persons multiplied by 100 friends you have. And you have the more than 11 million of IOs. Uh, 
relationship of friends with the same entity. It's obvious that so much disk activity is not accessible. Uh, acceptable. Uh, let's try to solve this quick. We could try to make a partition key to include user IDs as well. So non existing records can now be filtered by the room filter. Yes? But this has disadvantages. Uh, it forces us to use order preserving order preserve partitioner. Because if you use random partitioner, you will have to, for each like, you will have to ask every node of your cluster for existing order records. This just doesn't scale. Uh, it forces you to use key range scans to, to select uh, all likers of, of uh, all users who like this the entity. It has more network overhead. But the real problem is that uh, it multiplies partitions count by more than 10 times. So partition keys have overhead in both in memory and in disk. So in the end, you have twice as much data as you had in the beginning. So instead of quick solution, we decided to extend of Cassandra. And what we implemented is by column bloom filter. In addition to partition, partition keys, it stores pairs of partition key and clustering key into the main SS table filter file. So now to check the existence of the whole primary key, we don't have to touch this. We just do fast memory check. So the good is that we eliminated all of the reads when we query against the non-existing data. Uh, and the good is that it, the bloom filters uh, become larger, so they have less false positives. And the bad, the bad is that blue fil filters become too large. They are, they are hundreds of megabytes on disks. So this uh, leads to GC promotion failures because it led to GC promotion failures because uh, in earlier Cassandra, wall boom filter was located in a single chunk. Uh, but this is easily fixable, and actually we fixed it back several years ago, and uh, since that time, even the mainline Cassandra doesn't have any promotion with, with large boom filters. Uh, so we solved the disk accesses problem. Let's look at the network. This is how usually it looked like working with Cassandra uh, in deployment. So we have a client plus the application server. Actually, applicate, we have a lot of application servers. Uh, I asked the application server to, for, to, to, to get the information for, to render the light widget. So the application server makes a query for count. Uh, Cassandra makes internally several round trips to uh, get this data. Uh, then it makes a request for exists, uh, and Cassandra again makes some round trips uh, to get this data. Uh, and this is somewhat not good, but acceptable. Uh, two round trips per render at minimum we will have. Uh, thrift is slow, especially when you have a lot of connections. Uh, but the real problem is that to check for existence of your friends, you have to pass all the friends' IDs to the Cassandra cluster. And if you just multiply it by the number of operations and the number of checks to be made, you will have more than 200 gigabits of incoming traffic to Cassandra, just to check for friends. Well, so we definitely do not want the network traffic here to enter the like widgets. So we decided to collocate Cassandra and the business logic into the single data, specialized data uh, server flights. So instead of uh, separated application servers and Cassandra nodes, we have a single like server. It has a business remote interface. Exposing methods like get, uh, uh, which returns all the information necessary to render a single widget uh, in a single round trip. 
And for example, the method add like, which does the, all the necessary notations to, to file the like. Um, this remote interface uh, uses the one neo remoting. This is our internal uh, development invention. Uh, now it's open source by the plastic game. It's available on our GitHub. Uh, it is implemented for Linux and makes much faster and much less overhead I.O. than Java has. So any framework you will use on Java will have more overhead than one I.O. Even that. Um, well, cli clients of this uh, clients of this uh, cluster is topology aware. Clients send requests to Node owning the data. They know that the node which owns the data. Uh, and the requests to a single key will hit the same replica until it is alive. Uh, this, we call this replica by the primary replica. The others are secondary. Um, this allows for better cache memory utilization. So, uh, to select top and friends like the same entity, we, have, we take friends from the graph cache, which is located right in memory. Uh, this is in memory, fast in memory on the operation. We select, check it with blue memory bloom filter, and select some IDs matching blue filter. Uh, and we stop as soon as we have double of the, double of n, double of the number of friends we want to return. Uh, as soon as we have double of the, these friend IDs, we do reads. And we read until we have n friends, actually. Also, this allows us to implement custom caches, which are tuned for application. And implement custom data merge logic, because you have your, your business logic right inside of it. But this was not quite possible until we made a small hack to Cassandra code. We made uh, we made a listening for mutation. We made uh, we you, uh, we implement this simple interface which uh, has a single pre-applied method, and uh, you have to register it with your local Cassandra instance. Just this is, looks like just goals of, of the, of the uh, internal Cassandra classes. So you register it right between commit lock replay and uh, before the Cassandra joins the cluster. And so you uh, can start listening for mutations. Uh, we changed the original raw mutation apply code uh, to call this listener. So you will have uh, your listener, you have uh, the notification passed to your listener uh, for every original mutation like the triggers do in Cassandra 2.0. But beyond that, you have ability to extend with your logic replication mutations, uh, hints, read repairs. Uh, all the data that actually the node receives, you can check, examine, and do some additional tasks. So now it's possible to build a cache which is uh, optimized for likes. Not cache, but counters which are optimized for likes. Um, uh, the central part of this is. Uh, the counter cache. Uh, which is off heap. Uh, it uses some Mr. Safe to uh, store its data off heap. This is compact uh, because we don't store the inefficient and generic structures in, 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 the, in this cache. It is, uh, it is application specialized. I mean, they store only the counters. So we, we can put a lot of uh, elements in this cache. Uh, mutation mechanics is very like 
found in stock Cassandra counters, uh, but they are simpler. Each coordinator uh, replica increments only its part of counter. So we have we extended the like counter, the like count count family with IP address of, of the coordinator and the value of it, uh, the uh, node that had and the value of each node increments. Uh, so every each coordinator replica implements only each part of the counter and replicate counter state to replicate. Um, and it is application optimism because when we need counter, we may we only read the cache state of the counter, not even touching the network disks. So it is as fast as possible. This is would be not possible if we would not have a replicated cache of this uh, replicated state of this cache. Normally, Cassandra does not replicate nodes row cache states. Node can place to its cache only rows it recently read from the local SS table as a part of read request processing. This is not what we wanted because when we read only from local nodes cache, the cache of other nodes will contain no code data. So when one of replicas fail, others will have to serve all of its requests from the old caches. This will slow them down to death and so they fail and the load goes to more uh, secondary replicas, they fail as well, so you have all your cluster fails. This is a black card. So how are you replicated? Uh, we replicated by the mutations. When the primary replica reads the data from the storage, it actually issues, it, 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 it can see that it, that was missed. Uh, it issues the mutation at the same time stamps it just read. So other nodes for a, for a normal Cassandra replication will receive this mutation. And as we have a storage stored listener, it kicks in, sees that this is the mutation, and just replicates this data to cache. So the secondary replicas does not need to read anything. And this, uh, and we could build a long tail aware cache because it has a 40 persons, which are random reads. There are no much, uh, much. reason to, to have all these hot, uh, all these long tail uh, data replicated across the process. So the primary replica actually when it first reads the data from disk it doesn't replicate it to, to the secondary replica. It just places it to, to the local memory cache. But when the second request for the same data comes in, then it begins to replicate it to the secondary replica using this fake mutations. So this is all about the application specific code to the likes. So let's talk about in other problems that Cassandra we made. We made. Um, let's talk about how Cassandra reads the Oops. When you request data from your coordinator node of choice, of choice, it actually performs these steps. <coughs> it chooses one node for data and other nodes with, uh, for, to satisfy consistency level it, it chooses for data digest. When it sends the read request to all the nodes, one node will receive the data request, other will, others will receive the digest request. It waits for data and for digest. It compares and either returns the data or launches the read request. So, nice, on paper. Yeah. So, let's see what brings house to this clean schema. Notice are suddenly shut down, uh, slow down. Uh, 
every node's performance is not constant. There is sudden slowdown. Uh, there could be many reasons for this. Uh, I tried to summarize some of the, these reasons here. Uh, Cassandra, to fight this, actually, Cassandra has dynamic snitch, which tries to route requests to less loaded nodes. But dynamic snitch is not good working around sudden hiccups because it decides looking at information how they felt dozens of milliseconds back in, back in history, not now. Uh, and it even cannot know how it feels right now. So this brings the bad. You have latency spikes. And you have to wait and time out of one of your nodes of the B cluster. If one of your nodes times out, you have timeouts. Uh, Jonathan told earlier today about eager retry or read uh, faster read protection. Uh, it probably will save you from timeout, but it uh, will not save you from latency spikes. Uh, so we implemented another read strategy. We asked all the replicas for data, no dodges. Uh, it works best if record size of the data is comparable to digest like like record size. So we wait, we ask all replicas, we wait for the responses uh, to satisfy consistency level and we return as fast as we got all the replicas. Uh, so even if one replica falls behind, it has no really, really you don't slow down your request. The good is that uh, we have minimal latency response now, minimal possible latency. Uh, and later, after we had several node failures during operation, we learned that this approach has the one additional important benefit. The traffic and work of the cluster remains constant, no matter uh, all nodes of cluster are up or we operate in partial state. So this uh, sim greatly simplifies capacity and failure planning, actually, because if your, your cluster is working now, it will work even in case of massive failure. So more tiny tricks we did. Uh, for SSD I.O. we use deadline I.O. elevator like, like many of us do. Uh, but we patch it Cassandra to reduce the number of read requests. Uh, so we don't read in, 40, in 64 kilobytes, but we read just in 4 kilobytes. Uh, we implemented our own hinting uh, and this is like commit log for hints. It's not like implemented in Cassandra now. Uh, and we, what we do is that we, when node starts up, it waits until all hints to, to which other nodes have to this node are replaced. This helps us to synchronize the caches, so we can read local caches. And we do selective compactions. We compact column families which are read most, more often. So that's, that's all it's about, yeah? Uh, in the end, we have only one and a half milliseconds per request to request all the necessary parameters like we This is from client side. Uh, it, even less for from, from server, 10 times less from the server side. So that's all about the fast cluster. Let's talk about the fat. So the fat cluster is about charts. Everyone knows charts. You have one on one charts as well as you can invite more people to it. When you chat with someone, a new chat with unique UID is created. Uh, when you write messages, it has to be saved for the chat to the messages cluster. Obviously, messages are being cut at most of the time, but sometimes they are updated. Either user has edited the message or anti-spam system kicks in to modify the text. Uh, also, the special part of this workload is that the freshest messages page are accessed often. When you open a chat window, uh, 
uh, to write to someone or to read the just arrived message. We want to show you the latest messages you had with the other party. Uh, read of earlier messages are not common but still have to be provided. So chat has very long tail of all the messages. Uh, currently we have few billion chats with multi-billion number of messages. Uh, it has 10 times less reads than likes do, but still a lot, so it is the read most. For writes, they are mostly new messages, uh, as well as few updates of existing ones. Uh, messages are not only about text, they have some properties which relate to their management and rendering. All chat messages are stored in a single partition, <coughs> which key is ID of the chat. Inside of the partition, messages are sorted so freshest messages are going first. Having so much data, we wanted the size of the data stored to be as small as possible, so we placed all known key properties into a single block, because columns itself have overhead of both memory and storage. Uh, this brings a problem of concurrent modifications to the same column made from se separate servers and subsystems. Uh, we didn't want it to use some kind of log coordinators or something like that. Fortunately, there are very few updates. Most, most, most of writes are in sorts of new messages, like that. we have very few updates. So we implemented lightweight con conflict resolution. Uh, we added a version column to a messages column family and included it to the primary key of a message. We made this version to be a cluster and key, so all versions of the message is stored together. Having this version column allows us to have several versions of the same data stored in column family. So let's see how read modified write scenario could work uh, with this structure. Consider having two clients, first and second, ex both executing the read modified write on the single message in storage. The first client pulls data from the storage and receives current data D1 with the version of the data attached. Then it modifies the data in memory and wishes to write it back. So it sends the new data and the version and the version it just read it, uh, back to the storage. Storage uh, applies these changes by deleting the old data for TS1. It's used a new version of the data. This new version is actually microsecond, microsecond precision monotonic timestamp of the local storage node. And storage writes new data under this just issued version number. And currently, second client, uh, client executes the same steps, pulling data from cluster, modifying it, and writing back to storage. Storage will apply the changes the same way, deleting already existing TS1 version of all data, issuing a new version, which is now TS3, thanks to monotonic timestamp. Uh, so in the end, we will have several versions of data in storage we've got from conflicting update. On the next read, clients will detect this case and resolve the conflict. Uh, conflict resolution is made in application-specific way. Uh, so in addition, we build a specialized cache for this system as well, because we can. Uh, so it's so again, it's of heap, it caches only freshest chat page, it saves its state to local column family, like, like system column family, it doesn't replicate on cluster. Uh, it's needed to fast populate when you restart node, you start with cold, with empty cache, so we have to read it some, from somewhere. And we read it sequentially, which is much, much, much faster than reading keys and reading the data from column families like Cassandra do. So Cassandra do. Uh, and it deploys in memory compression, so we have to twice, twice memory for free. Uh, well, this is about reading messages, but we have also to store it. Uh, we use four unit servers with the spinning disks, many of spinning disks, and when we started, we started from four terabytes per node. Uh, all we have is the size tier compaction. When you use size tier compaction, you will have, in the end, after major compaction, you will have four terabytes in the file. This is kind of unmanageable to large. And you can distribute this four terabyte across many disks. Uh, what we're gonna do? Write 10 or maybe
can be a level compaction backport, backport level compaction from the mainline Cassandra. Uh, well, Ray is a possible solution, but we tested that it provides slower reads. It is on slower writes, and it's pricey, it's not reliable. Uh, level of compaction backport is, is too, just too much effort to implement. So we decided to split single column family to more than 200 pieces. They are split by token range. Uh, so we've got smaller and more frequent memtable flashes because we flash not, not a single memtable flashes but many memtable flashes. They are smaller uh, more often, but they don't add to compaction. The compaction still is size still. Uh, so in the end, we have a lot of S stable files, so we can distribute them across disks. Now uh, let's uh, see how it is. The default disk, disk distribution policy in built into Cassandra is take the disk with the most free space and write the SSD. Uh, but some disks become overloaded by a read request. And some were idle, I don't know. But they are filled equally. What happens? Investigating this, we found that this is because some disks have more newer SSD tables than others. Consider just finished compaction. Big file is removed. Disk has a lot of free space. So all main table flashes go to a single disk. So, but newer data are being read more often. So you have this. Some disks are overloaded and some are idle. We tried several disk allocation policies inside our company. Even round robin, just round robin of disk allocation works better in this case. But finally, we got into the generational policy. Uh, each disk, this works in a way that each disk has the same number of same, same generations and, and tries to keep in the same. This, it doesn't look at the size, at, at the free space. So that's all about the fat pasta. <laughs> Let's go to other one. I've been thinking a lot about which Cassandra cluster is the ugliest Frankenstein in our freak show. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, meet the Chad Summers cluster. This cluster is about messaging too, but unlike the fat cluster storing messages, this cluster stores index of active chats of the user. Uh, you can see it on the left side. This index shows number of unread messages, is just read or not. It has a small data set, only about a couple of gigabytes, and a hot set having only five persons of misses going to disks. The hard part about this index is, is that it reorders itself too often. For example, if you have a new message from someone we want, uh, uh, from someone, uh, we want that someone's name to be on top of the list. If you have several chats open with unread messages, we want chats of your close friends to be on the top of the list. And so on and so on. So when you read the message from a chat, we also can reorder it. Uh, so it is being reordered on almost every write of a message to a chat and read of a message from a chat. Uh, so because of so much reorders, So because of so, because of so much orders, we store a whole list of summaries in a single block. Because trying to implement these reordering seven, having summaries split to several rows in Cassandra will lead us to too much tombstones. Uh, having many tombstones in, in Common Family is not a good idea. It hits performance better. So we choose to store it in a single block column. And because we choose it to store it into a single block column, we, call, we have almost no inserts uh, and a lot of updates to existing lists, to existing values, which bring potential conflicts from. 
Any of 27,000 writes down to this cluster, uh, every second can potentially do read modified scenario against a single alarm. We can't save which one for sure. If we choose on the fat clusters way of conflict resolution, we'll have a lot of tombstones with the old removed version columns because just too much updates. Uh, using some kind of distributed log coordinate uh, was not an option again because the number of uh, not potential but actual conflicts is not so high. So pessimistic locking distributed log coordination brings in is, is an overkill. Uh, taking in account that merge algorithm for conflicting updates is doable for this for the chart summary list, it's somewhat complicated but still doable. We decided that we need some kind of high performance conflict detection here. But Cassandra can detect conflicts. So the obvious choice was to use vector clocks. Cassandra doesn't have vector clocks, but Voldemort does. Uh, Voldemort is another distributed storage system modeled closer to Cassandra than the, to Amazon Dynamic, Dynamic paper. It does not have any structure like column families or so. It maps third binary keys to binary values, uh, but we don't need the structure for just summary. Uh, Voldemort have distributed coordination logic pushed to client sites. So clients could be implemented only in Java language. Java is perfect fit for us. And Voldemort has pluggable storage engines and architecture, so you can implement your own storage if you wish. We did test some storage engines available for Voldemort out of the box and uh, available on the internet, and found that their performance at scale is not very good for us. So after a couple of performance tests, we implemented a new storage engine for Voldemort based on Cassandra. <laughs> based on Cassandra persistent player. The only thing we've done, we developed our, our own cache for data. Uh, we love developing caches, eh? by the way. By the way, <laughs> sorry. Um, so you might ask why to give life to such an ugly friend in China. Yeah? The answer is simple, the performance. For a test cluster a bit of free cheap commodity service available today mapping 8 byte keys, which is chat ID to 1 kilobyte binary value, which is a list of summaries, we reach the total performance of 90,000 operations per second. So, six nodes cluster can handle all the load of chat summaries of our social network. Uh, so, that's all about the IO cluster. So, you might ask, why Cassandra? Well, for us, it has the usable distributed components. Uh, it has structure of data. It has column families, so you don't have to pull all the data you can ask for for a piece of it. Uh, it delivered promises of, of, failed, uh, fa of working when servers fail. It is implemented in Java, so we can change it easily. So we can build distributed systems faster and not reinvent the wheel. So that's all. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yes, so I heard the uh, rumors that you guys are considering going to uh, Cassandra 2.0. Um, yeah. How are you going to, like, are you porting all your optimizations? Do you not need to? What's the um, idea? It's, uh, the Cassandra 2.0 is uh, efforts going in, in another way. Currently, we don't plan to replace all those clusters we did develop it with the older Cassandra. It, it, it has no much reasoning. Uh, instead, we're trying, we have, uh, Internally, in, in our infrastructure, we have Microsoft SQL servers, which do have some uh, transactional data. And we want to replace the those because of cost and reliability. Uh, so we are now developing a solution based on Cassandra 2.0, which, uh, which we could drop in instead of Microsoft SQL server. Uh, and this is 
it's very actually very very interesting system. It is not ready yet, so I think uh, in a year I will <laughs> have more information about it. Uh, basically, we're building a system which is available for its always available for its, and it has transactions and it has rollbacks. This this stock assembly doesn't have rollbacks, even transactions. Thank you.